Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to CHK Law. Welcome to the second of our 2022-2023 Greater China Legal History Seminars. Thank you all for joining um, for what I believe will be a fascinating seminar today. Today's speaker, Mr. Douglas Clark, is of course known to many of us, uh, not just because of his practical work, uh, now in Hong Kong, previously in Shanghai, but uh, also because he has published a lot about China's Chinese legal history. And he was also one of our speakers uh, at previous seminars, uh, and we are very happy to have him back. Thank you for joining again for doing this once. Mr. Douglas Clark is a solicitor advocate and a partner of Douglas Clark LLP. He is the author of um, a very interesting book, Gunboat Justice, A History of British and American Extraterritoriality in China and Japan, as well as over a number of other legal texts. Uh, Doug Star studied Chinese and Chinese law at Fudan University from 1988 to 1999 uh, to 1990. He started to practice in Hong Kong in 1993 with Lovell White Durand and in 2000 moved to Shanghai where he established this firm's office and became the managing partner. He was a barrister here in Hong Kong from 2011 to 2019. And until the end of August 2022, he was the head of global dispute resolution of Rose. Today, uh, Mr. Clark will speak about Sterling Fessenden, the American boss of Shanghai 1925 to 1939. And uh, I'm sure this is a great topic and a fascinating topic. Uh, but before I pass the virtual floor to the speaker, I wish to mention that we have, as always, reserved some time at the end of the seminar for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please use the chat function, send them in. I will read them out on your behalf. And uh, hopefully we will have a very engaging, a very interesting discussion session after uh, the presentation. And with this, uh, welcome again. Uh, thanks to you, Doug, for uh, doing the talk for us. And um, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Lutz. Um, and welcome, everyone. I see I've got a, a good number of attendees today, which is, which is, um, of course, makes me very happy. Um, and if you have read Gunboat Justice, you will have come across Mr. Sterling Fessenden I'm going to talk about today, but you don't have to have read it. Um, uh, I, it's a standalone talk. Um, the materials I'm going to be covering to you is I am planning to write a book about him. I have been out doing research and, and, and you know, as you'll see, gone to his hometown and various things. Um, but as every, everyone, at least uh, uh, the academics know here, writing a book is one of the hardest things you can do because you've got to write um, and finding time to do that is, is difficult. Um, nevertheless, um, I have collected a lot of interesting materials about him and I think um, his life gives us a very interesting insight into um, probably one of the most important times in modern Chinese history, um, the 1920s through to 1930s, when China really came as, as its own nation. Um, the Guomindang got strong, and, and then the Japanese invaded, um, and that's really been uh, an important part of, of, of modern Chinese history. And Fessenden was right in the middle of all that. And um, uh, so we're going to be looking at, at, at his role in, in those, those affairs and, of course, the Shanghai Municipal Council, of which he was in charge. Anyhow, with that, I will start sharing my screen. Um, and just, so I hope everyone can see that. Um, so um, there is our man um, uh, looking there, um, very dapper in that photograph. Um, uh, as we'll see, he doesn't always look that dapper, but uh, uh, he, this one, I actually saw this photograph first on a display in Shanghai um, uh, a number of years ago when I was wandering by. In fact, uh, I really hadn't heard of him until then, uh, but I did think, remember seeing this photo, I think, well, he was a pretty good looking chap. Um, so, why we call him the American boss of Shanghai? Because in Shanghai itself at the time, because he was in charge of the city for so long, they would actually call him the Lord Mayor. Um, and the quote there, the man who beat Dick Winterton, uh, Vita Judge Green, was uh, uh, Judge Peter Green of the British Supreme Court, uh, because effectively he stayed, he was in charge for 14 years of Shanghai, which is apparently longer than Dick Winterton. I don't know. 
Um, you also see there's lots of cartoons of, 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 of Fessenden. I'm sharing a few of them today because he was such an important man in Shanghai. Uh, the newspapers regularly characterized him, uh, characterized him uh, doing different things. Um, newspapers around the world. This is from an American uh, newspaper. Again, calling him Shanghai's Lord Mayor. Um, Native Amer America, of course, but Shanghai is sitting on a powder keg. Um, and then he's talking about the problems of the Japanese Chinese clashes in Shanghai. Um, just a picture of him showing him doing his job. Um, this is him uh, as the chairman of the council or the secretary general. He was in charge of the police force. Um, and actually, Shanghai volunteers will come on to that. So um, he ran almost a country. Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai wasn't quite a country. We'll come on to this. It was a treaty port, but the Shanghai Municipal Police had um, its own police force. Uh, Shanghai, Shanghai Municipal Council had its own police force. It had its own army, militia, uh, the Shanghai Volunteers Corps. Um, the only thing it didn't really have was its own courts, which is uh, uh, the first part of this topic because Fessenden himself was a lawyer and he came to China um, to practice as a lawyer. Um, this is a quote from a letter to his old alma mater, Bowdoin College in Maine, a beautiful little uh, uh, liberal arts college um, in, uh, in, um, in Portland, uh, just north of Portland, it's not in Portland, um, in Maine, which I, I visited, and they have a lot of materials on Festin there. Um, in there was some correspondence with the university about giving Fessenden an LLD. Um, and many people just wrote glowing responses, but this one came from Shanghai. I can't work out who wrote it um, because the signature is, is illegible and it didn't give a name of the addressee and I didn't see the original letter. Uh, but this is from an American in Shanghai asking what do you, uh, in respond to the question is what do you think of Fessenden? And um, as you can see, the writer first wrote, you know, his long service is a tribute to his ability, especially in view of the fact that he'd done this in what is virtually a British community. Uh, very important that Shanghai was principally a British community, but he was an American there. Um, he is considered one of the leading Americans in the community and possibly in the Far East. So um, the writer gives him a lot of credit, but then as you'll see, he goes on. I say this all to the credit, although personally, I do not agree with him or greatly admire him or care for him. He represents a diehard attitude and so fits in the position with which he is honored. He represents an attitude that will have to go before this community can become international. His group only yields under pressure and as little as possible. So why did this writer think that? It's very interesting to go back into this history because it shows there was not one unified foreign view of, of what Shanghai was about. We read the histories and we see, you know, sort of Shanghai Municipal Council, everyone thought it was great and it was running. That was not the total community view. And Fessenden was one of the key people keeping the foreigners in power in Shanghai. We will see, though, he was a very flexible person. I think the Germans call it, I, I remember this from the year, that you know, real politic, you know, like you, you, politics is about reality. And even if you want to keep things out, you, you have to sometimes accept what may be the unacceptable. But I think this, these quotes really sum him up and what, what, what his life was about in Shanghai. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so just before we go on, let's um, just go back. Who was he? Where did he come from? Why did an American end up in Shanghai? And why was he, is in fact, the quote suggests they're often called to be more British than the British. Um, so first, he was son of Nicholas Fessenden, who was a, ja a lawyer, um, a judge of probate court, and at one point, the Secretary of State for Maine. Uh, and in fact, the Fessenden family in, is a very large political family in Maine. A number of senators have gone to the United States Senate, um, and there's been politicians in the family for a long time. Uh, and there remain a lot of politicians in, in the family. So if you go to Bowdoin College, which is the Feston family school, it's not just Sterling, but a large number of Festons went there and they had very, very um, successful careers in Maine in particular, but even uh, federally. So he comes from a town called Fort Fairfield, and this is a picture that I took from basically the time, this is roughly the time when Feston was growing up. Um, and shows the small town, uh, now about 4,000 people and probably then about 4,000 people. Um, interestingly, and this is probably one of the reasons he's more British than British, um, if you see the hills in the background there, they are in Canada. Uh, Fort Field or Fort Field is in very far northern Maine. And literally when I went into the town, my mobile phone switched to Canadian 
um, service providers. Um, the border is towards the end of the town uh, on the left there, and behind that is Canada. Uh, the radio's there. When I was driving a car up, it was a long drive. It's four hours from the nearest airport, uh, which shows you how remote it is. Uh, the radios were all um, broadcasting in French, uh, or some in, some in English, but I got, I got a lot of French radio because it's next to New Brunswick, where there's a lot of French community, and still a lot of French speakers, even in that part of Maine. Um, so he comes from a small town in northern Maine, and there's actually a railway line running along the river on the, the uh, what would be the south bank of the river, which is the other side from where you can see it. That was the only connecting railway line at the time, and that was Canadian Pacific. It went into Canada. So for me, I think this he's, he's, he's growing up in very remote part of America, which was basically only really connected with Canada, was part of the reason he could fit in with the British so well. Um, that part of, um, of, of, of Canada was very British at the time he was growing up um, at time. In fact, Fort Fairfield at one point was part of Canada until the Americans had another war with them and, and, and took it back. So that is his house, uh, number 45. Um, uh, uh, from that picture, zooming in, so quite a large house, uh, very well, relatively wealthy family, uh, doing well in 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 Fort Fairfield. Uh, I went back; house is still there. Um, it's been shortened a little bit, um, and uh, yeah, Fort Fairfield is a, it doesn't have a hotel. I had to stay somewhere else, but it's a it's still a fairly nice town. Um, lots of people from south have moved up. Um, it gets absolutely freezing in winter. Um, the the people I was talking to when I was in a bar said, "Yeah, the." roads freeze and in fact the pipes under the road even freeze because it gets so cold it gets down into the soil so the, the, the they usually burst water mains once a year in, in most of these areas because it's so cold up there. Okay, so he, he went to high school, uh, primary school and high school in in in, in Fort Fairfield. Um, then he ended up in Bowdoin College, you know, a picture from his time there, obviously a very gentlemanly scholar, um, uh, probably very British at that time in Bowdoin College as well. Um, Interestingly, this is a quote from the uh, one of the yearbooks of his class, um, and we'll come on to his uh, his love life a, a little bit later on. But this quote was quite interesting because, uh, um, it, as you can see, I'll, I'll read it. Perhaps the pleasant little boy in class, however, is Shorty Fessenden, whose fresh young face and sorry, I've just got to close this, and artless prattle must often have caused his mother much anxiety lest he should be kidnapped. And this fate actually came near overtaking him, for on the evening of the Democratic Parade, a wicked married woman whom he had innocently engaged in conversation decoyed him into a dark side street and seated him by the backstrap of his ulster with the evident intention of carrying him off by force. At his childish appeals, however, her heart relented and she let him go. Um, there is far more to that story than we could ever work out, um, but it is interesting that uh, Feston was obviously a in the sights of a married woman, at least, shall we say, when he was at university. Um, um, we can guess he's a bit of a player from them even publishing this. Um, interesting, though, Atlas Prattle, because as we'll see later on in life, he certainly conquered that and became a very fluent and competent lawyer and politician. So, sorry. Um, then, um, once he finished his, uh, his, his studies abode and he moved to New York, uh, he went to New York Law School. That's where he qualified as a lawyer. I, as far as I can tell, part-time. Um, uh, the records there uh, just have him there. But uh, at the same time, he was working in the American Trading Company in New, in New York. Uh, there's one story from the local paper that he um, used his legal skills to great effect when one of his bosses had sent him off with a contract saying, just take this over to get it signed. Feston couldn't resist himself and read the contract spotted a major error that would have cost his company a lot of money, went back to the boss who sort of said, what are you doing bothering a young man? He said, no, no, you really need to look at this and you know, save the day, according to this, this newspaper article. They loved him so much, they sent him to Shanghai to represent the American trading company. So in 1905, when he would have been about 25, he arrived in this beautiful city. Um, and that's a, a drawing of the Bund around that time, um, horse-drawn carriages, of course, um, and not the buildings that we recognize now, except the British consulate, which is the entrance there on the, on, on the right. Uh, but all the other buildings have been replaced. But this is a town he arrived in in 1905, at first representing the American Trading Company. Shanghai at the time, another cartoon from, uh, uh, this was marked the cacophony of the Shanghai streets, just noisy Chinese, a totally 
different environment from Fort Fairfield, even I think totally different from New York City. Um, but uh, this is where he turned up and made his life. Okay, he then became a lawyer, as he was a lawyer already, um, he then uh, qualified and started to practice as a lawyer first in the consular courts, not for very long because he only arrived in 1905. And in 1906, the United States Court for China was set up. Um, this is a picture of the United, the only picture I've been able to find inside the court of the United States Court for China. Um, this was actually sitting in Tianjin in a Marine Court, uh, court um, uh, a Marine barracks um, when they went on circuit. Um, and uh, Fessenden is not in this photograph. That's actually got Norwood Ullman. If you came to my Shanghai lawyer talk, you would have seen this. That's Norwood Ullman, second from the left in the lawyer's um, seats. Um, and on the left, there's actually a British barrister appearing in, in, the, in the United States Court for China. There was a custom that lawyers of any nationality could appear in any other foreign court in China. And Fessenden did appear in the US, British courts. Um, I'll come into that in a minute. So why did we have the, this court system? It is what we called a system of extraterritoriality. And what that meant is foreigners were not subject to Chinese law. Effectively, is like every foreigner living in China was a diplomat. For any crime or civil action, you had to sue someone in their own court. And so China and Japan, which I covered in Gumbo Justice, had no jurisdiction over foreigners. So this is why Fessenden ended up practicing in the United States Court for China and also appearing in other courts around uh, Shanghai and the country. At its peak, there are 18 countries of extraterritorial rights and quite amazingly, Shanghai at one, at one point had 21 courts and legal systems. Uh, why that? Um, because there were three Chinese courts in Shanghai, uh, mixed court in, um, in, in the uh, international settlement, the French mixed court in the French settlement and a Chinese court for the area around uh, Shanghai that was not part of either settlement. So this is a world that uh, um, Feston landed in as a lawyer. I'm sorry, and then there was other countries had consular courts and the British court here. Um, and that's a pretty picture of the British court, just so you can see it, that they had a very nice courthouse there in Shanghai that is still there if you get a chance to get up there when quarantine and all those uh, other issues uh, um, uh, got rid of. Um, although if you're in Shanghai, you can pop by. It's on Yuan Ming Yuan Lu. Okay, there's the mixed court, which was a, a technically a Chinese court, um, but it had foreign policemen, as you can see there, guarding prisoners and a Chinese judge and a Western assessor. Um, and I won't go into this in too much detail, but the, most of the time the Chinese judge was a sole decider, but had to listen to the views of the assessor. But actually from uh, 1911 to 1925, the assessor and the judges were effectively co-judges because of um, the Shanghai Municipal Council taking over the court um, uh, with the uh, Shanghai Revolution. Um, that's actually Norwood Ullman on the bench there as well as, as an assessor in the mixed court. So what about the US Court for China? Because uh, this is where Fessenden practiced very successfully uh, for a number of years. Um, this was set up um, to follow the British Supreme Court, which I just showed you, as a se separate American court to deal with Americans. Why? Because America was seen to be not effectively enforcing the laws. I won't read this in full, but uh, Secretary of State Root wrote to um, President Roosevelt about the problems of lack of administration of law of people seeking shelter on the American flag, um, and that the uh, gamblers and prostitutes of Shanghai generally flourished under the claim of American citizenship and the protection of American indifference. Um, and so to such an extent, the prostitutes in Shanghai came to be called American girls. Um, so under the consular court system, uh, the um, American legal system in Shanghai was considered totally inadequate. And Fessen arrived in while well, that system existed, but very soon after that, the US Court for China was set up. And this is a picture of Judge Wilfley of the American uh, US Court for China. He arrived, he is from, um, uh, he arrived from the Philippines where he'd been the Attorney General, relatively young judge, about the age of 40. And effectively, he took it upon himself to clean up Shanghai and get the system to be operating properly. The first thing he did was rather than uh, we did get around to 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 convicting prostitutes and gamblers, um, but the first thing he did was to disbar 
effectively six of the eight American lawyers in Shanghai. How did he do that? He um, created a special test for all lawyers, American lawyers in Shanghai, of whom that's showing them doing their test. Um, five of them sitting at the front. There was one other, he, I, I don't know why he's missing, but uh, five of them doing their test with, with uh, Fessenden standing there at the back with his uh, to-be law partner, Thomas Jernigan, Jernigan, who was a former US consul, consul general in Shanghai, standing at the back, not looking very worried. Why were they not looking very worried? Because Jergenen and Fessenden became the only two American lawyers allowed to practice in Shanghai. Um, in Fessenden's case, uh, Wilfley said he had some of the uh, recommendations of the highest order from America, and Jernigan, as a former consul general, of course, had that. All the other lawyers were disbarred um, and kicked effectively not allowed to practice, which led to some cases in the court. But Fessenden started a charmed life as a US attorney by being one of only two American lawyers who could practice before the US court. As I mentioned before, it didn't bar British lawyers and other lawyers from practicing, but the reality was if you wanted to argue American law issues, uh, it's much better to have a US lawyer for anything complex. And Fessenden did that. He practiced uh, very successfully um, through the years until he became uh, too involved with the municipal council to not be able to uh, deal with his cases. He was in, in many, many of the cases. I'm not going to go through them today, but in Gumbo Justice, if you read them, he, he is involved in many cases, uh, including one that came to Hong Kong when he represented the owners of an American ship that had been seized by the British during the First World War um, and uh, as a prize, and they brought the case in down to Hong Kong to seize that ship. Fessenden did not appear in the Hong Kong courts, but was the American lawyer for that ship instructing the lawyers in Hong Kong. Um, the other judge in which Fessenden was deeply involved in um, was a judge called Judge Lovinger. Um, in this case, um, so uh, Judge Lovinger was probably the best judge of the US court for China. Um, after Wilfie, Wilfie only lasted about two years because he finally got kicked out, forced to resign by the president because he caused so many troubles in Shanghai by uh, prosecuting people um, and disbarring all the lawyers that eventually was asked to resign. One other judge came briefly, and then Judge Lobinger came. He had been a judge in the Philippines, in the Philippine Court of First Instance, um, and practiced, uh, and as a judge was considered to be the best, he, he introduced new rules. Uh, he got amendments to the act to make the operation of the U.S. court better. But then later on, he came under serious attack from one lawyer called William Fleming, who wrote a long pamphlet criticizing the United States Court for China and suggesting that Lobinger was biased. Fessenden became hugely involved in this as a leader of the American community in Shanghai. He was chairman of the US um, uh, American Bar Association there to defend uh, Will, uh, Lobinger from these accusations. Um, they went so far that uh, William Fleming filed a complaint against Lobinger to the State Department uh, that was investigated. Uh, both Fleming then headed over to America to back up his complaint by meeting with it. And Fessenden decided that he had to follow. Um, and he followed in quite an amazing way because the steamer that was taking Fleming to America, well, actually to Yokohama first, um, and then onto America, was already steaming up the Huangpu River and Fessenden uh, got a launch and chased after the boat and managed to get on board. And so then he was on the same boat as Fleming heading to America to both uh, one to attack and one to defend the court. Um, apparently they were not having the best uh, relations with on board the boat uh, to Yokohama. Um, any event, uh, uh, the investigation of Judge Lobinger went on. Um, and eventually he was cleared. Um, some of the reports suggest he was asked to resign, but he refused to. Uh, Fessenden's involvement had been very important to say most of the community support him. Fleming is actually um, the one who is um, uh, caught stirring up trouble. Um, in fact, he stirred up so much trouble in one case that uh, he's found in contempt of court and sent to prison for six months by Lobinger, um, a, a sentence that was ultimately, as part of, it seems, a deal with the US president, uh, remitted to only three weeks that he'd served already in the consular prison in Shanghai. Um, so Fessenden was the main lawyer by this time in Shanghai, uh, a main US lawyer in Shanghai, and uh, very involved with the courts, as I said, also practicing very successfully. 
But moving on to the key topic of this core of this talk is we then get to Fessenden and his involvement with the Shanghai Municipal Council. Um, this is a photo from uh, later on in the 30s when he's Secretary General. Um, you can see him sitting up in the standing up in the far right hand corner. Um, sitting in the middle there is um, uh, the middle third from the left. If we're looking from our left, is calling Cornell, Cornell Franklin, who was the then the chairman of the municipal council, and he was the only other American to be a chair in the uh, 20th century. So Fessenden was chair, but then he became secretary general, um, and Cornell Franklin was the only other American to be a chair. You'll also see there some Chinese, and we'll come on to that, but Fessenden was, despite his diehard attitude we heard about, one of the key sponsors to allow Chinese to sit on the municipal council. Uh, the Chinese had a very clear argument that I think Fessenden as an American must have um, agreed with, which was no taxation without representation. So the Chinese had to pay rates, so tax, in the municipal council, but they didn't have any representation in the council. So eventually the council relented and allowed uh, Chinese on it. There's also a couple of Japanese gentlemen there because the Japanese community was very large in Shanghai and also had their own representatives on the council as well. So it became a British, American, um, Japanese and Chinese council with a number of other, small number of other foreigners. But for most of the time from 1925 to 1939, Fessenden was the man who was really in charge. He was paid a lot of money. Um, this is uh, from his hometown newspaper, the Fort Fairfield Review, uh, showing he was making 41,900 US dollars per year, which even today is not bad money. Um, uh, many people make less than that. Um, uh, but that came to a weekly income of $950, which I'm just trying to think of a comparison. This was a huge amount of money uh, for the time. Um, it was probably close to half a million US dollars. So he was paid extremely well to be in this uh, half a million in, in modern terms. So more than the US president gets paid now um, and you know, equivalent of what our, uh, I guess our chief executive gets paid. Um, but I'm sure he insists on this pay because he had a very successful legal practice and probably was making more as a lawyer. And this was the way that they could get him to come in and run the council. So if, if you can say money talks, the Shanghai Municipal Council talked with their checkbook in getting Fessenden to be their secretary general. Um, as I said, um, cartoons all over the place about Fessenden, and this just shows him um, when uh, some British candidates are coming in, everyone had to go to see Fessenden and learn about how the SMC operated, um, and he was seen there as the guru. Um, you'll see on the left-hand side of the podium that uh, um, uh, Fessenden is sitting behind is the land regulations. Um, if you're not familiar with Shanghai um, uh, legal uh, history, um, the land regulations were the effective constitution of the municipal government. Um, they've been negotiated between uh, the British, mainly the British, I think the Americans had some involvement, and the Daotai, so the former um, governor of um, Shanghai in the 1860s, I think maybe 1850s, and set out the rights that uh, foreigners would have in China and the rights Chinese would have, um, for example, the area of the settlement when there'd be expansion of settlement. Um, one area that uh, became very involving, uh, that the Mess Fessenden came very involved in later was the land regulation said that the municipal council would have jurisdiction over roads it built outside the settlement, what were called extra settlement roads. Um, and that later on created a lot of problems about how to police those areas and where the jurisdiction came and ended. So a lot of roads went outside the settlement. For example, if you know Shanghai Hongqiao Road, what an extra settlement road, um, and that, that western area was a big problem for policing and governance uh, along there. Uh, it became a big problem later on. It, when, when the foreigners were strong and the Chinese were weak, it wasn't a real problem. As China got stronger, it became a problem that needed to be dealt with and Feston dealt with it. Okay, just another photo, just showing um, uh, a different view of him. He's there in the left-hand corner. This was the opening of the American Club, um, uh, which opened in 1925. That's the Consul General, I think, in the front. Uh, Judge Lobinger there in the, uh, in the third from the uh, uh, left. 
and the American Consul General uh, Edward Cunningham is actually on the steps. He's the one who laid the foundation stone. And of course, Fessenden was a large part of the American community as well in this American uh, and a member of the American club as well as, of course, the, the, the Shanghai club and everything. Uh, just as a as a, as a as a by by the by the American Club has later became the uh, Intermediate People's Court in Shanghai, and a High People's Court shut there. I actually went to a trial there in 1989, and I would actually have to call it a show trial uh, because uh, they brought foreign students along, and we went in there. and I really can't remember much. I wish I'd taken more photographs, but uh, um, we sort of had a defendant come in. Um, denying all allegations against him um, uh, and being found guilty. And then we got to speak to the judge in the case afterwards. And I asked the judge, I said, um, how come you just believe the police statements? Uh, you just read them. You didn't even get the policeman in here to say I caught him stealing. And the judge said, well, of course we believe the police. So as an Australian, it was a strange thing. But anyhow, it was a little digression. It's now the Shanghai Financial Court. Um, and in fact, uh, China bought this back from the uh, Americans when America and China entered into diplomatic relations. Uh, they paid in 1984 350,000 US dollars, which at the time was still quite a substantial amount of money. Um, and all the members got that were still alive got a little bit of that money. Okay, before we get into his time in the municipal council, we've seen that uh, uh, Fessenden had at least married woman had an interest in Fessenden. I'm sure there was more to much more to that and everything else in his life. The one other thing of Fessenden that is fascinating me, but I've been able to find almost no information is he never married, but he had a long-term lover called Olga, who was a Russian. Um, and I've been able to find almost nothing about her, which frustrates me because I know there must be a lot written about her in some files somewhere. Fessenden was such an important person in Shanghai, intelligence services, particularly Russian intelligence, must have had files on her. I suspect the Shanghai Municipal Police would have had a file on her, but that would not have been an official file, because obviously their boss is Fessenden, so someone would have kept a secret file. But I haven't been able to find any of them, haven't been able to track down anything about her anywhere. Um, I don't read Russian, so I haven't been able to dig into the Russian newspapers in Shanghai. There may be some. Uh, but this is a photo of Fessenden at a ball with his Russian friends. Um, and I assume one of the Russian friends is Olga um, and probably the lady on the left. Um, the only other, inf one small piece of information I have about Olga is that she was much taller than Fessenden um, and apparently was quite buxom. And there are stories that Fessenden, when he danced with her, used to rest his head on her breasts. So uh, that's, <laughs> that's all I know about Olga. And a little bit more, which he talks about, will come on to the very end, because she did inherit some stuff from, from Fessenden. So nothing, nothing much more we know about her, except that maybe this was his lady friend there on the left. But even that, I can't be sure. OK, in the Municipal Council. Um, so sorry, just to, to go back. Um, so Fessenden in 1923 joined the Municipal Council as a councillor. Um, just to, uh, we've talked about a brief, the Municipal Council under the land regulations for Shanghai. It could pass bylaws, but it didn't pass any other laws. So all the people living in Shanghai were subject to their own law. We've talked about that in terms of extraterritoriality. Uh, British law, American law, Japanese law, Swiss law, um, uh, German law, Austro-Hungarian law, while the empire existed, uh, Russian law. Um, so whatever nationality you are, you're subject to that law and your own consulate. There were a very few small number of foreigners who did not have treaty rights, and then they were subject to Chinese law. That number of foreigners increased substantially after World War I uh, because Germany gave up its extraterritorial rights. So Germans became subject to Chinese law. Uh, and Russia, after the Russian Revolution in 1922, gave up extraterritorial rights as well. So then the mixed court in Shanghai got very busy dealing with Germans and particularly Russians because there was a large influx of Russian refugees. Um, they actually set up a special chamber to deal with Russians in the mixed court uh, uh, under Chinese law because there were so many of them. Um, so the municipal council, as I mentioned, it could run Shanghai except it couldn't pass laws, but it had its own police force. Um, we saw, um, I think, and it had the volunteer corps, 
which was a militia effectively. And that is a picture of Fessenden. I'm sorry about the quality. I haven't been able to find a clearer one yet. Um, sitting there with the volunteer claw as the chairman of the municipal council. He became chair in 1925 and stayed on till 1929 as chair when they asked him to be the secretary general. Um, so there he is as chairman with his military, which technically he was in charge of um, and could give orders to and did give orders to. The municipal council a number of times have called out the um, volunteer corps to protect Shanghai when there were attacks. And we're gonna come on to that in a second. So it was a city with its own army a volunteer army in the Middle East. It also had foreign troops stationed there. The British kept, um, until 1940, uh, regularly kept troops stationed in Shanghai. So did the Americans, had Marine Corps there. So did the Japanese uh, to defend the city. Um, this is the municipal police. Um, I haven't found another picture of a festival with the municipal police, but again, here shows uh, the chairman of the municipal council. You can see uh, the Shanghai municipal police logo there in the background, sitting with a number of the members of the police force. As you'll see, made up of quite a number of foreigners, um, also Chinese in the second row, and then the Sikhs. A very hierarchical police force in that the senior positions, almost all the senior positions and the important positions were held by foreigners, mainly British, but not always British. There were, there were Germans and Russians and a number of others. Um, the Chinese police were there to deal with Chinese. Um, very few got to any higher positions. Um, and the Sikhs were effectively the muscle. Um, they were the guys to keep everyone under control. Um, they had those big red hats. Um, and I'm trying to remember the, the, the Hong Bao or Hong Tao, Hong Tao, I think. The red, the, 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 the um, uh, Shanghainese called them the Hong Tao, the guys with the big red hats. Um, and so that was also directly under Fessenden as both the chairman and the um, um, uh, uh, then the secretary general of the municipal council. Um, what year was this? This is 1927. So this is in fact, while Fessenden was the chairman, but for some reason he couldn't make it into this photograph. If you look at the closely, you can see it's a uh, happy new year, 1927. So this is the police when he was in charge as the secretary general. So, Fessenden became the chairman and then stayed on in chairman during some of the most difficult times of Shanghai's history. Um, and this is why he, and we're going to come to why he was paid the big money that he was paid. Um, this is from 1937, just an example of some of the battles for Shanghai. So here you see the secretary of the uh, municipal council who was underneath uh, Fessenden issuing a proclamation if that there will be a curfew from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, due to this is fighting with the Japanese at the time. So the municipal council could issue curfews, which they do enforce, and they will say, if you do not comply, you will be arrested forthwith. So again, just showing the power of the council and what they can do. They ran this city through the police. So what were the issues that um, uh, Fessenden had to deal with? Um, number one, the May the 4th movement, a very large nationalist movement in, um, in, uh, in China uh, against foreign powers, probably the, 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 the major crucible for the Chinese people to start standing up. There was, there was a protest after Versailles, but um, where Chinese students started protest protesting in Beijing, and there were major, major protests in Shanghai. Very large protests were actually riots. Um, so here are the police defending. You can see it's on Nanking Road, Nanjing Road. This is the, uh, the loser police station is actually a little bit up that lane. And in the corner there, this is a police on Nanjing Road um, that sent there to protect the police station. Um, and they were given orders not to fire. But in one police station, they were being overrun and they did fire and they did kill a number of Chinese. Um, this led to... Um, serious repercussions that Feston had to deal with as the chairman of the, of the municipal council. Number one, there was an inquiry um, with, led by foreign judges, uh, which the Chinese were asked if they wanted to join, but they, they declined, um, that uh, concluded that a large pro uh, problem with the uh, reason for the writing was that foreigners had been treating Chinese very badly. They had a justification for saying their country, uh, parts of their country should not be occupied by foreigners and um, uh, that there needed to be changes. 
Um, I just add here, there was also a large number of prosecutions in the mixed court of Chinese rioters, um, but uh, there were dead people in the streets, I haven't put a photo there, and it was a huge challenge to the council. As a result of the Commission of Inquiry, which um, had a Japanese judge, an American judge, and a British judge sitting on it, um, the Municipal Council decided that they had to do something about extraterritoriality and its changes, and they got a judge, um, uh, Fessenden, in fact, arranged for a judge from South Africa, Justice Feeson, to come and do a report on extraterritoriality. Uh, not surprisingly, given the report was paid for by the Municipal Council, and this goes back to the diehard attitude, uh, the report was, yes, things need to change, but not quite yet. Um, uh, we will, uh, you know, uh, the Municipal Council serves a great function and it will need to come later. Uh, similarly, an extraterritoriality commission was set up by the foreign parties that traveled around China to study the new Chinese legal system, visited prisons and other places, and there were suggestions in the reports that sometimes when they went to a prison, um, China actually established what they call modern prisons, where all foreigners would be sent. So not the old Chinese style prison, but modern prisons, but there's suggestion in the report, which I'm sure is true because it happens anywhere in the world, that just before the commission turned up at the prison, everyone got out their paintbrushes and painted and they got good food into the cafeteria and made it look nice. But um, uh, the extra commission also reported that extra charity should end, but not quite yet as well. So Justice Feetham and uh, uh, through on Feston's uh, uh, instruction, uh, well, I'm not instructions. Justice Feeson was chosen because he was a very uh, well-known jurist uh, who had done a lot of similar reports around the world. But Justice Feeson seemed to conclude, along with the um, uh, uh, the municipal council, that extraterritoriality couldn't quite finish. One final suggestion that was floated and may have actually occurred, except for World War uh, II, was that the foreign courts remained for a while but they would try cases under Chinese law, which is a, an interesting concept. Um, uh, and so that there will be Chinese laws being tried in the different courts of different countries. So everyone becomes subject to Chinese law for an interim period, but still have the confidence that they'll be appearing before their own nationals. And eventually that would change to there being only Chinese courts. Um, then Feston faced probably his biggest challenge. Um, because in this case, there was direct threats to the settlement. The Guomindang in, uh, uh, in 1922 under uh, Sun Yat-sen originally, then Chiang Kai-shek, had established the Huangpoa military, Huangpoa military Academy in Guangzhou. Still there today. I haven't actually been there, but it's still there today, and I, I do want to go sometime. Um, and they received training from both Germany and Japan in military tactics and military training. Uh, and very successfully, because, um, oh, sorry, I should make it up. The Guomindang at this point were based in Guangdong province. They did not control the rest of the country. The rest of the country had various governments for the time of which China would call the warlord period. Um, and uh, for example, in Shanghai, around Shanghai, there was a governor who had his own armies. He gave some recognition to Beijing, Peking, the government in Peking, but really did his own thing, had his own army, would fight with other armies for control of territories. And so China from 1911 through to 1927 really was broken up into many different distinct parts, something a lot of foreigners don't appreciate. Um, and the Guomindang, which had actually been part of the original government when, uh, when the Qinghai Revolution occurred and Sun Yat-sen had been provisional president for only three weeks, had moved to Guangdong. Um, and then they'd started training a modern army uh, with both German, Rus German, Russian, and Japanese trainers, uh, a lot of Russian trainers. Um, very, very effectively, because by 1927, they were able to launch what they called a Northern Expedition. And by 1927, and reoccupy most of uh, um, uh, Southern China up to Yangtze. Um, and by 1927, they were on the gates of Shanghai, literally. And there was a serious concern that they would try and take back the Shanghai International Settlement and the French concession. Uh, it wasn't uh, just a, a theoretical worry in Hankou and some other cities they had, in fact, militarily taken over the settlements. Uh, so foreign company, foreign countries rushed troops to Shanghai. This shows some, uh, I think, American Marines arriving in Shanghai uh, in a force called Shah Force, S-H-A-F-O-R-C. 
PPE. Um, uh, they brought in up to 27,000 troops, which were put on the edges. The municipal, municipal council uh, under Fessenden also um, uh, uh, mobilized the volunteer corps. And so there were troops all around the outside of the Shanghai settlement, the international settlement, defending the settlement, ready to fight the, um, uh, the Guomindang if they came. Um, then as part of Fessenden's real politic or dirty dealing, um, Fessenden did a deal with the Guomindang. Um, they said, our main problem is the communists in Shanghai. We want to take them out. Um, but they're sitting up there in Jabe. If you know Shanghai, they're in Jabe, just on the north of your settlement. And we can't get around there easily because we have to go around the settlement. And the best way for us is to go through the settlement. Now, normally the foreigners would be, that can't happen. You can't have your troops coming through the settlement. Uh, but Fessenden did a deal that allowed them to do that with their arms, pass through the settlement and kill and then attack the communists from the direction they were not expect, expecting in Jabe. And they did that very successfully, almost wiping out the communist army around Shanghai and retaking the whole of the area. Um, to also be fair, Chiang Kai-shek was not a stupid man. Um, with all these foreign troops in Shanghai, it would be a total waste of his military resources and needs to attack Shanghai with all these foreign troops when his goal was to take over the country. Uh, we can deal with the sentiment later. I suspect I haven't actually seen it written down anywhere. It's probably in reading some. I haven't seen it. Um, even for members of the Guomindang and others, um, they quite liked having Shanghai International Settlement there because it was a very safe place to own property and keep your assets. Um, when the country's at war, it's nice to have a nice safe place. I'm actually in Switzerland at the moment where I'm doing this. Similar to Switzerland in World War II, it became a very convenient place for everyone to exist. So I don't think they really wanted to take it over immediately. Um, they certainly wanted it back and they, 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 there was negotiations over that, but they didn't want to take it over immediately. So Fessenden was deeply involved in this negotiation. The story is he actually negotiated the deal with, I forget his full Chinese name, but the, the, uh, the gangster who ran this, the, the French uh, concession is to do um, and the, uh, the Guomindang. Um, so as part of this, the US Marines actually created the Fessenden Fife. So he got these named after them. Their Fife is a, is a musical instrument. Um, and uh, that is a picture of the Fessenden Fife with the 4th Marines um, in Shanghai. So uh, um, he had um, that named after him. He also got a road named after him, Fessenden Road. Um, and I Chinese name escapes me. It was an extra settlement road in Hongqiao, runs out where the uh, Shanghai United Family Hospital is these days. So we get into then the really next big challenges. Actually, before we get to the war, um, in 1931, with the Guomindang in charge of the country, as I said, they were extremely successful. They occupied, reoccupied, took over Beijing, and by 1928, it occupied the country. By 1931, they were militarily very strong and in a position to come to the foreigners and say, you can't maintain your settlements in China anymore. We have the military might to get rid of you. Um, this is actually why I called my book Gumbo Justice, because it was really whoever had the power of the gumboats or the military had the power to enforce the treaties. By the time the Guomindang was established as a government and settled, and actually bringing about huge amounts of legal reform and um, uh, uh, in China, um, they were able to say by 1931, uh, you have to get rid of extraterritoriality. And in fact, the British and the Americans agreed. The British actually initialed a treaty that would bring an end to extraterritoriality by 1941. There was a 10 year great, there's a 10 year period where there'd be a slide in. Extraterritoriality would be allowed to continue in the settlements that he still existed, uh, but not in the rest of China, and eventually would be abolished in Shanghai and the settlements as well. Um, the British, uh, the American ambassador was due to take a gunboat up from Shanghai to Nanjing to initial a similar agreement. In fact, the British and Americans were ready to sign. The reason it was initial was actually from Chinese side saying, 
we can't sign this at the moment because there's huge opposition to us agreeing to any continuation of your rights within our own party. We need to get that worked out um, and get them to get it accepted that we're going to have to allow some rights to continue for a little while. And that then all came to an end because in 1932, Japan invaded and occupied Manchuria. Well, technically didn't operate. They set up Manchukuo under Pui, but they were effectively in charge. Um, and uh, also attacked around Shanghai to push the Chinese troops back and establish what, uh, what they call in the textbooks then a cordon sanitaire or a sanitary cordon. So a 15 mile radius around Shanghai. They said, no, for, no Chinese troops around here. We are gonna protect Shanghai. Why did the Japanese do that? In fact, by this time, the Japanese were by far the largest investors in China. And I think they, the number estimate is between 50,000 and 100,000 Japanese lived in Shanghai at the time. So the Japanese had a very major interest in protecting Shanghai and pushing the Guomindang back. This led to some serious major battles um, uh, around Shanghai. The Guomindang the Japanese, everyone thought the Japanese would be successful, but actually the Guomindang put up a massive resistance and uh, it took the Japanese a long time to push them out. Um, but there are some photographs of the different fighting. You can see um, that's the uh, North Station, the top left-hand corner, uh, the old Shanghai Station, main station until uh, the 1990s. Uh, that's some, some Chinese machine gunners. Um, if you look closely in the picture on the bottom left-hand corner, that is looking from uh, the uh, park, uh, no, not the park hotel, the Peace Hotel north, and you can see shelling and bombs going up in the top left-hand corner there. Uh, also, you can actually see the British Supreme Court for China in the front centre, um, the British consulate's there, and that's the British Supreme Court for China as well with Yan Ming Yan Road. Um, not an angle you normally see, but people are taking photos of the bombing there. And then, of course, a bombed out building there in the street. So there was serious street battles all through Shanghai, uh, both in 1932 and 1937. The 1937 battles were um, when Japan, China invaded, uh, Japan invaded China proper. And again, huge resistance from the Guomindang. But eventually they were pushed back up the Yangtze River. Um, and then uh, Japan occupied the Yangtze River Valley with the Guomindang being forced back to Chongqing. Um, although if you look at maps at the time, the Japanese didn't occupy all of the Eastern Seaboard. They occupied certain areas, but certainly the Yangtze Valley that they occupied and took control of. And again, they weren't technically didn't become part of Japan. They set up puppet governments. So Chinese um, uh, politicians were put in charge of the areas, for example, around Shanghai uh, and also in Tianjin. So again, a picture of Fessenden, this time showing his real political ability because he had the Japanese now in charge around Shanghai. And they said, we're in charge now. It's our army. There were still British and American Marines in Shanghai, nominally defending the settlement. But with the Japanese army, particularly from 1937, ensconced around China and in Shanghai, they basically said, we're the bosses now. We've got the army. We want to actually take control of the municipal council as well. And there's Fessenden. Um, he was uh, credited with huge wily negotiations and ability to keep the... Uh, um, uh, the Japanese at bay solely through the land regulations and diplomatic negotiations. Um, but you can see uh, what uh, Sapaju, a very famous uh, cartoonist from Shanghai, thought about the job that Festin was doing there. Um, it was a very tough time for the foreigners in Shanghai, um, but Festin showed his amazing ability to um, use whatever political skill and ability he had. I will add here, he had one thing in his favor, the Japanese were not yet ready for war with America or Britain by in the 1937 through to 1941. Uh, so effectively, Fessenden managed to keep, uh, well, the municipal council managed to keep a status quo. They had to recognize more Japanese on the, uh, on the council. At one point, there was an assassination attempt after Fessenden stepped down during a council meeting by a Japanese, uh, but they managed to keep the sort of general status quo that it was principally the foreigners in charge uh, right through to the 41. Okay, so Fessenden 
done a great job, but eventually he decided he had to retire and um, he was replaced by his secretary, uh, George Godfrey Phillips. Um, Fessenden, uh, why did he retire? He was actually quite ill. Um, the report said he was a little bit ill. He's actually quite ill. He had both a heart disease and he was going blind. I think he would have liked to stay on, but at the end of the day, he had to, in 1939, retire. And he retired in Shanghai. He probably, I'm sure, stayed around to consult and uh, and, and, and assist people, but he did eventually um, have to step down, which may have been good for him because only a year after he stepped down, um, there was an assassination attempt on his uh, successor, Mr. Phillips, who was, and this is literally almost out of some Chinese martial arts movie, um, was literally driving to work in his um, uh, uh, big uh, Ford uh, car, as you can see. Um, and there was three rickshaws parked by the side of the road on different sides. And the, with umbrellas, I'm not joking, the rickshaw drivers all had umbrellas. And then as his car came by, they threw the umbrellas away, got out machine guns and opened fire, uh, not machine guns, the guns, and opened fire on Philip's car. And you can see there's a circle there on the picture. That is where one of the bullets hit. So it actually went inside and just missed Phillips, uh, who survived. Um, they never caught the assassins, um, but they believe it was Chinese trying to assassinate them because um, the count was still seen as foreign. It could have been, could have been Japanese. Uh, but it, point here, it was a dangerous job to be the Secretary General of the Shanghai Municipal Council. Uh, Feston luckily never faced a direct assassination attempt, but his successor did. Okay, so we then get to almost the end of the Municipal Council and the end of Fessenden's life. Um, in 1941, um, the Japanese occupied Shanghai. Um, and uh, this is actually the American club I showed you the photo of. Um, and they raised the Japanese naval flag, that's a naval ensign, um, over the American club. Um, and took it over, kicked the Americans out. Now, um, probably a lot of you know this, they did not actually start to intern people immediately. And in fact, British working for the Shanghai Municipal Council were told to report to work and continue to report to work, even though it would mean working for the enemy. Um, the same for Americans. In most of the rest of the world, you would have been treason to continue to work under an occupying force but not in Shanghai. It was considered too important in Shanghai to Shanghai continue to operate and people were told to go to work and continue to work. Um, and foreigners were not interned in Shanghai until 1943. So Fessner was not interned. He was obviously sick at home, living under Japanese occupation, um, but he was not interned. Now, the consular officials, including courts and judges, were all taken... Uh, were all actually repatriated. They were put into, they were interned for six months, then finally repatriated. So there were no courts left uh, for cases to be heard in, um, in, 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 in Shanghai for, for Americans or for British. The Swiss took over the representation of the, uh, of the, of the uh, Americans and, and the British, uh, took over the premises of the uh, consulates, uh, which were not touched. It's interesting. When they, when they came back in 1945, Nothing had been touched in either the consulate uh, in the British consulate. Uh, in the American consulate, things had been moved, but not nothing had been destroyed or taken away. The Japanese had recognized um, the protection of the premises, even though ha they had repatriated the staff. Um, but not having a court probably didn't matter. Most people were living. Um, uh, life was just going on under internship. So then what happened in 1943 and why did the Japanese suddenly decide to intern foreigners in 1943? The simple answer was during the course of 1942, um, American side decided that ending extraterritoriality would be a good idea. China was an ally. China was occupied. Um, there was no good reason to keep extraterritoriality. The war made a good break. And so they, uh, with Britain, Britain and China negotiated a treaty with uh, Britain and, sorry, Britain and the United States negotiated a treaty with China to end extraterritoriality ending on the 1st of January, 19, uh, sorry, not the 1st, 8th of January, 19, oh no, 8th of May, 1943. Sorry, it was signed in January. It actually took effect from May, 1943. Um, 
And that's what brought an end to any extraterritorial rights in China. And I believe the Japanese were recognizing those rights because they weren't technically in charge. It was still under a puppet government uh, until then. And then they only interned people after that. Just as an aside, there was still in existence extraterritoriality, obviously, in um, and the courts in uh, uh, non-occupied China. And there was actually the very last trial of the United States Court of China happened in Chongqing in uh, 1943. A US serviceman with the Flying Tigers had killed one of his uh, um, fellow members and he was tried in the court in, um, in Chongqing um, and uh, convicted by a judge who'd actually flown in from India. They'd sent a military uh, judge in from India to sit as the final judge of the um, uh, US court for China. Anyhow, Fessenden, because of his ill health, and I think the respect the Japanese had for him uh, from his position in China. The, the, the thing about occupation of Shanghai is totally different to Hong Kong. Hong Kong was nasty. Hong Kong people were rounded up, they're put in internship camps, and they, they had a pretty tough time. Shanghai was different. The, if you read the histories, you get wrong perceptions from books like Empire of the Sun. Um, people were put in intern camps, but they weren't particularly difficult places to be. It wasn't pleasant, of course. You'd rather live in your own home. Uh, but because there were other nationals that people knew living there, they could get German, Swiss, other people, they could get supplies to them and they, they could live quite happily in those. In, in, well, in, and the, the, the commandants of the camp were actually quite well respected. And I remember reading something just recently, commandant, one of the camps was Japanese, was very upset with the sort of depiction in things, in books, that he would treat people badly. And he actually had a number of testimonials from Americans saying, no, we, it was all fine. He, he, did, he had a job to do, but he did it as nicely as he could. In Fessenden's case, they didn't do that. They kicked him out of his beautiful house. I think I have a picture. So this is his beautiful house in Shanghai. Obviously, it looked better than this. Uh, on Jululu, if you know Jululu in Shanghai, a beautiful part of the French concession. This was his very large house. Um, and he was kicked out of there um, as part of internment um, and uh, moved just up the road to this house um, in also on Jululu. Um, uh, and uh, only one floor. And so he had to move there with uh, his boy and Olga for his internship, but he was not put into any camp. Um, and he was very unwell. He was so unwell that in September 1943, when uh, they allowed a number of internees to be repatriated to America, um, Fessenden was off first was offered a place. He turned it down. He said, I'm too sick. Um, but when the boat arrived back in America, he arrived back with news that Fessenden was dead and that he'd died. He'd, uh, he'd seen uh, uh, some of the passengers before they left and he was in so unwell, they actually believed he had died before they left at Shanghai. So a lot of reports you'll see that he died on the 20th, 20th of September, 1943. That is actually wrong, long, wrong. He lingered a little bit longer, but died the next year in early February, 1943, uh, 1944. Um, he wrote a last letter to his brother that was given to the Swiss authorities uh, that go on. Um, and um, it's a touching letter. It, uh, it, it talks about, of course, money and assets and, and where things are to go. But two quotes here I thought sort of touch on him as a human. Um, uh, oh, sorry, and his brother was a priest, um, quite a well-known priest in America. Uh, first, he does mention Olga again. When I made the will mentioned above, I left to a Russian girlfriend, Olga Pashketevik Korvin, who had been kind to me, who had been kind to me. Interesting. All my estate in China, with the exception of a small legacy to my number one boy mentioned above, who, which beside the house mentioned included a certain number of shares in local industries, value which we in this uncertain time uh, um, we don't know the value. And then this final, as I said, almost touching quote about how he saw his life. Being of the clergy, you may not approve of some of the things I've done, but after all, my intentions were good, and I cannot see that any real harm has come from the life I have lived. It has been altogether selfish. It has not been altogether selfish. A good many people testify could testify to that if there were any need for it. So that's how he saw himself um, for all the time he'd done his service in uh, Shanghai and his service to the Shanghai people. Um, and is it true? Is it not? 
Um, obviously, as historians, we have to analyze that. There are many people who thought Fessenden was wonderful. You can read that. Um, others who disagreed, as we've seen already. Obviously, Chinese did not think that anyone running the municipal council was um, doing it, not doing any real harm. I think the Chinese got shot in the mixed court rights, certainly thought that the municipal council did some real harm to them. Uh, but that's the history that we have to look at and consider. However, there's no doubt he was truly well respected and did a fantastic job of the job he was given, which is to run and protect the interests of settlers in Shanghai. And he did it very, very well. So what's his legacy? This. This is a picture of, uh, of Shanghai just after the war. Um, and you know, he was responsible for making this city the type of city where the investments could be made, that people could build this type of grand um, uh, fund and invest in and make Shanghai at the time. I think at one point it had 25% of China's GDP coming through Shanghai, even, even, even in post-communist, uh, after the Communist Party came to power. So um, certainly, while there's a lot of other questions you can raise about whether colonialism, extraterritoriality was a good thing, uh, certainly there is a legacy that is we can see here. Finally, do we still find anything of Festin in Shanghai? We do. This is the only thing I know. As I mentioned, Festin Road has been renamed, um, but you can find this uh, plaque, which I've been to, um, and I forget which road it's on now, of a stone that he laid. Um, it was obviously previously covered up. Um, uh, all these stones were covered up in Shanghai. They've now been uncovering these where they still exist and um, allowing them to come to, come to light. Um, so this is a laying of a foundation stone at the Shanghai Telephone Company. And you can see it was laid by the Secretary General, General E.B. McNaughton, who was a British, um, uh, previously been a colonel in the British Army, got a retirement promotion to Brigadier General, um, and then he joined BAT. And so that was the sort of person who was the, 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 the Secretary General, uh, sorry, the, the, the Chairman, but with Fessenden there as the Secretary General, who was really running the place. So if you ever go up to Shanghai, you can try and find that. And if anyone knows of any other places where you can find him, it would be great, because there is no gravestone um, at all. Um, I, um, uh, uh, his will and his last letter asked to be he cremated, and I assume he was. So his ashes are probably scattered somewhere in Shanghai, uh, but I don't know where, and there's no record of that. The family gravestone does not record him. Um, it's in Fort Fairfield, very large grand Fessenden gravestone. I, I'd hoped that even the family would have at least said, um, and also in memory of Sterling Fessenden, but not. And just as an aside, because it runs all the way back to how did an American run a British city so well? The graves literally are about 100 meters away from the Canadian border. The, 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 the cemetery in Fort Fairfield is on the Canadian border. And um, when you drive there, in fact, um, you can go to the town golf course, or you actually go, go past it, you go to the town golf course, the golf course of Fort Fairfield is actually in Canada. You park your car in the USA, you walk across into Canada, and you play your round of golf, and then you come out again. So um, while we say he's an American, his upbringing and where he came from means I think he was very acceptable to the British, and he had a love for Britain and, and things. So that was, I think, I, a little bit um, short on time, but roughly within the, the scheduled time. Happy to answer any questions. That was a very quick run through the life and times of Sterling Fessenden, um, lawyer politician, army boss, everything. Um, an amazing life and very little known about it. So I really hope I can get to write my book. So Lutz, I'll turn over to any questions. Thank you very much. Um, a fascinating talk um, about a great man and um, a very interesting period um, of Shanghai, of course. Um, again, if you have any questions, please chat them in so that we can raise. I've received some already, but if you have more, please uh, send them through so that I can read them out. If I can start with two questions um, up front. Um, the first one is, what were Fessenden's major legal achievements, if you could summarize them? Because you talked about mainly his role as um, a leader of Shanghai, basically. Yeah. But from a legal point of view, what were his major uh, achievements? And then 
the second question you mentioned at one point he was more British than the British. Uh, yeah. Was there anything American about his work? Was there any feature that you could that you would well see as you know representing American culture, American approaches, and so on? Okay. Um, yes, two two very good questions. I'll, I'll sort of combine the answers if, if I can, because I want to deal with that American side. Yes, he was still an American. Um, I think the the more British than the British was a quote from Shanghai that he could he could act like the British, be British. I assume, and this is something I learned only on this trip when I went up to Fort Fairfield. I assume he his accent was almost British from just where he was brought up. Um, that part of America at the time, in all of New England. Well-educated people spoke with an almost British accent. Um, and if you go and listen to, um, uh, we forget which president, the president before World War II speaking, um, and you can find some on YouTube, he has pretty much a British accent. And you still see it sometimes in America. Um, and I assume um, that he had a very close to British accent, and probably not a strong one, but just that American British accent as well. Um, having read what, accent he spoke in but he was just considered i think the british liked him because that way he could fit in with the british but at the end of the day he was still american he came to shanghai with the american trading company his principal court he practiced before was the um uh the american the u.s court for china all his major cases which i'll come on to were before the u.s court for china um, when they were challenged the court that i talked about by william fleming it was fessenden who protected the interests of the US court for China. So he was still clearly an American and, and his loyalties laid with America um, and being a lawyer. And he, well, I, I find it, he appeared occasionally in the British court, but really not for any major cases. I think everyone realized if you have a big case in your in, in a court of a, another jurisdiction, better to get the lawyers from that, that, that country appearing, who know the rules and know the judges. Um, some of the major cases, um, just trying to think. Um, the biggest case, which wasn't a court case, was his defense of Lobinger that I talked about. Probably one very interesting case where he came in and shows the respect he had is <clears throat> there was a case where in 1913, where um, Chinese could not own land in the foreign settlement. But if they wanted to buy land, they would get a foreigner to buy it, would then sign a trust deed. And the trustee would then let the Chinese basically say, I hold it on trust for you. That usually worked well, no real problem. You know, obviously the trustees would 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 make probably make a little bit of money. Uh, the Chinese would get their land for doing their building. Um, the reason they couldn't own land was not because of the foreigners, it's because of the Tao that the Tao Tai had actually put that into the, the land regulations. There was one case where a American had died, and um it then the executress, his wife, um, executing his will, ended up as the owner of the land. And of course, she wanted nothing to do with it. Um, and so it went to court. Um, there'd been a case in the mixed court that had said the land belonged to someone, one of the two claimants, so two claimants of the land. But that couldn't be applied to the American executress. So then it went to the um, uh, American court. And in the first decision, which Fessenden did not appear in, the court ruled that the land belonged to someone else, uh, one of the claimants, but different to the uh, mixed court. Um, I don't know, uh, to, 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 to the trustee. Uh, Fessenden was then instructed on this loss to come back and he and his partner at the time, I, I, I forget who it was, uh, did a huge amount of work and first got the judge to agree to set aside his own decision, which is very hard, and then got the judge to agree that he had no power to say who owned land under the Chinese system, a uh, 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 Chinese piece of land. And therefore um, uh, it was ordered that the land be transferred away from the executress to someone else. So she didn't have to deal with it, but Feston had a uh, very big success in that case. Um, he was also involved um, in some cases. Interestingly, when William Fleming started his attack on the courts, um, Fleming was acting, uh, Fessenden actually was Fessenden's lawyer, representing him in a defamation case against some other people. He eventually dropped out when he couldn't get instruction that was fighting against him. Um, 
I, I don't have, I can't remember any other major cases he's involved in. I mentioned he was involved in the Hannah Medal case, which is the American ship that was seized by the British, um, but only as the lawyer, the American lawyer, and he had to pass it on to lawyers in Hong Kong because that came before the Hong Kong Supreme Court because the British court in Japan, China did not have prize jurisdiction. Um, so then, uh, so major cases, that's it. Um, was he American? Yes, uh, he's still American, but I think that's where his political skills were so great. Um, the Americans considered him American, but the British um, also loved him. I will say, I did find in one uh, correspondence file of the British consulate, uh, sorry, the American consulate in uh, Shanghai in 1927, the US Consul General wanted him Diselected, if that's the right word, did not want him to be elected again to the municipal council. He disliked him with a passion. I think in the belief that uh, most of these consul generals at the time, I can't remember this one, uh, could speak Chinese. They'd been trained in Chinese and had uh, quite a like uh, uh, a love for China. And uh, he did not like Fessenden and what he stood for, and the protection of Shanghai. And he wrote to the British, uh, the American uh, minister or ambassador in Beijing saying we want to have to do everything we can to get Fessenden off council and got a reply back saying that's none of our business um, who can be who can be elected uh, but it is interesting he obviously had some he wasn't loved by everyone is the other thing in particularly Americans strangely um, uh, in, in, in China. Yeah that was actually a follow-up question sent by Steve was there any criticism from the U.S. community in Shanghai of Fessenden for his Britishness uh, although the U.S. judges seem to like him. Um, I don't think so. Um, not not too much. I mean, think I think the the real criticism of him was um, deep down the running of the municipal council, at least in the early years, was racist. And mm. I have found one quote from Feston, which is very racist mm. about Chinese and their abilities. Mm. Um, uh, I didn't put it up here. It will go in my book, but it was, you know, sim simply basically they're not capable of running a city or doing anything. And so we're going to have to keep them out. Mm -hmm. uh, but that has to be read in the context of the time because everyone was racist at that time, unfortunately. Well, not everyone, obviously not everyone, as you can see, but many people were. Mm -hmm. uh, but to his credit, um, as I mentioned on this point later on, when the pressure for Chinese to become members of the council got too strong to resist, Fessenden is the one who sponsored the change to the rules to allow them on the council. He got up, he spoke at the rates, rate payers meeting, he said this is something we have to do and I welcome them joining. So he's a man who could also move with the times or as I said be a, a, a politician who understood I have to deal with the world I'm in and not the world I'm not. The one other thing I can say is it does appear that all the Chinese he negotiated, because he had to negotiate with the Chinese over all sorts of things, policing of the Western mm. settlement, uh, policing of the Western roads, border lines, disputes over jurisdiction. He was negotiating with the, the, the Chinese all the time. I have to say, from what I've read, and I haven't gone into the Chinese language material yet, I have to say, but from what I've read, um, the Chinese respected him a lot. Now, mm. that doesn't mean they liked him, but I think they respected him as an honest negotiator which can in course also include telling you i can't do that or i can do this because there was at one point and I, this where this became clear there was at one point when they were negotiating over the western roads which was a huge problem because you had police bumping into each other uh, you had you know who has jurisdiction behind that house and who has these they finally actually set up a western district police force we've had foreigners in it and chinese in it to deal with that air problem again negotiated by by fessenden at one point, the negotiation stalled, and the, the only reason seems to be why they stalled is Fessenden was away. He'd gone to America for three to six months, and the, the Chinese just would ne not negotiate with anyone else. Um, and when he came back, they reached a settlement. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that reflects, I think, everyone's view of him, at least, that he was a man who could be trusted. Didn't mean you had to like him but he was at least honest in his views and honest what he would or wouldn't do. Thank you. Uh, one quick question. Um, he didn't speak Chinese, correct? As far as I'm aware, he didn't speak Chinese like most of the uh, uh, foreigners in China. Well, sorry, not most. Um, this is probably where the division in the community came and the attitudes were. There were actually 
obviously missionaries, most missionaries could speak Chinese. Um, and all consular officials, uh, you remember if those who attend my Shanghai lawyer talk, yeah. um, you saw, um, Norwood Ullman spoke fluent Chinese because of his time um, in, uh, in, the, in the consular service and sat as a judge in the Chinese court in Chinese. Um, so this community did speak Chinese and had a much stronger love for China and disliked um, uh, the attitudes to Chinese of others. So there's certainly that element of, of, of a break in the community. Mm -hmm. And there is an interesting point about that because in Shanghai Lawyer, Ullman never mentions Fessenden, which is actually quite fascinating when you think yeah. about it. Because yeah. uh, yeah. he was, they were working together. They, they would have been together all the time. He never mentions Fessenden by name. He mentions a few cases of him, but so he obviously didn't like him either. And mm. I think that's probably the bigger divide in the community rather than, um, yeah, yeah, the, 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 as was from that quote in the beginning. He and his like of oh, this quote, I've got it here. Um, um, the die hard attitude. Um, and that was definitely an attitude. We're going to fight, fight for the last. So. Two more questions came in. Uh, when the internship began under the Japanese, it seems Fessenden was one of the few to be moved from his home. Have you found any particular reason for this? Question number one. The question, yeah. que the second question relates to famous Olga, of course, a fascinating character, uh, especially how you have described her. Um, and you say there's no information about that. The question is, where would you look for information? Which archives, where where, where can you potentially find something? Yeah. Okay, yeah, good question. I, I, yeah, I love talking about the archives. So that may not be a short question. Um, sorry, what was the first question? I could, we have oh, more, so keep it short, please. Now, what was the first question again? Sorry, that was- First question is about why he was moved from his house okay. while okay. others were allowed to stay. Very few are allowed to stay in their large, he had a large house and very few are large, allowed to stay in their large houses. They were often moved up. Um, mm -hmm. um, you won't find many people allowed to stay in there if they had a large house. Um, he needs house. He was actually just moved down the road in Julalu, not very far. It's like 100 meters. Mm -hmm. What I read, I've read, I haven't confirmed, but it, uh, it's believable is either a Chinese puppet government official or a, 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 a Japanese army officer wanted his house. <coughs> Mm. And so they moved in, which happened to many people, and he got moved out and, and moved down the, down the road into uh, the house that I showed you. Um, okay, Olga, archives. Um, so the possible archives is the Shanghai Municipal Police archives are online, but I found nothing. So those things, the rest of them are actually in the National Archives in the USA, mm -hmm. um, because uh, the CIA picked them up and took them over there. Um, they'd been put into the British consulate, but the CIA took them there. So you can actually go and access those. And I will go through them. But as I said, I don't expect the police archives will have a specific file on Olga herself. It would only be comments about her scattered around places if there is any, because that was their boss. And you don't keep a formal file on your boss. Mm -hmm. No one's that stupid. Well, some people are that stupid, but most people aren't that stupid. Um, I suspect Russian intelligence would have had a very big file on her. And was she Moscow working for them, do you think? Oh, no, I just because Russia had interests in, in, in Shanghai. The mm. fact that she was a Russian national with obviously direct contact to Sterling Feston would have been of great interest to them yeah. um, and what she, what she was doing. The British intelligence probably would have kept a file for the same reason. Um, America didn't really do intelligence that much in those days. If, if, you, if you remember the history, they only set up their first intelligence uh, um, uh, during World War II. Um, oh, shit, names, where where Allman worked, uh, the, the names just got out of my head. But, um, but so there's probably nothing. There might be something in the American consular files, which I'll have to go through. Um, but it's it's the problem with this is it's going to be other than the Russians who I think probably had a file with her name because she was a Russian citizen stuff. It's going to be the long slog of just going through and looking yeah. for comments and other files. It's going to be tough. That's why I haven't got anything. Okay. Uh, next question. Fessenden did a deal with the Kuomintang to wipe out the communists. And I remember you said that he allowed yeah. them to go through the, uh, the concession to, to uh, attack the uh, the communist army. Um, how is Fessenden seen in China nowadays? I mean, that that good good question. Actually, I have not gone and looked. At, I mean, I, th there's very little written about him in China in Chinese that's easily accessible. Um, I don't think 
it's necessarily just blamed on Feston, even though he's the one who, who did the deal. There's more on the foreigners. Um, mm -hmm. And this just shows, you know, that foreigners can't be trusted and they did this. Um, uh, I also think Chinese, communist Chinese history doesn't dwell too much on their failures over time. It dwells much more on their successes, um, the Long March and Yan'an and the ultimate revolution. Um, so um, it's a very good question. I will go and do some research on it because I would like to know what the Chinese had to say about that too. I'm sure there is some, some, some work on it, but I haven't found anything that really ultra critical on him on that point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When uh, extraterritoriality was abolished in 1943, uh, Fesson okay. was already, I think he had retired. Was, uh, do you know what his position was? Was he in, was his, his view in line with the, as you said, the official British and American view, this should be done? I have no idea. I suspect um, he also probably looked at the current situation and thought, well, the reality is this, this is yeah. what's going to happen. You know, what are we coming back to after the war? Um, I can say for sure they didn't consult any of the foreigners in China. Uh, this was done purely at a, at a higher diplomatic level. Um, they had no interest in what the, the, the foreigners in China thought at the time. It was really just seen as this is something we've agreed to get rid of. The city is in occupation. Let's just get rid of it. And you can read the it's, if you if you it's all people who are interested. It's all on the foreign relations of the United States um, mm. uh, uh, things, which you can find online. Uh, you can read about it. Uh, there is no reference back to what anyone in China thought. It's just literally, this is this is this is what we're doing. Okay, and we're running out of time. But one last question: uh, What is the legacy of Fessenden's time now? Is there anything left? Is there any major achievement which we still you know, which, which still influences uh, China, uh, the way things are done? Well, I, I think the legacy, it's all part of the general legacy of um, extraterritoriality, as they call it in the Chinese constitution, semi-feudalism, uh, semi-colonialism, sorry, not semi-feudalism, semi-colonialism. Um, Shanghai was obviously the <laughs> largest, clearest foreign settlement in China. And one of the things that the Chinese this day, today's day, look back at and say, this is how, this is a very important part of the century of humiliation. This is how the foreigners humiliated us. So Fessenden himself personally is, I think, just treated in as that larger part, but certainly the efforts he made and the things he did to keep Shanghai foreign run and foreign controlled mm -hmm. um, have an impact on that story. Um, you know, if, for example, um, there'd been earlier end to extraterritoriality under the Guomindang, it would have been um, uh, not during the war. It's, it's something that would have changed how Chinese viewed foreigners and, 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 and view change. Um, and of course, then there's the other side. If the Guomindang had stayed in power, then there'll be a different view of history as well. Um, just to put that the other way around, if you read Gumbo Justice, the Japanese version of history of exactly the same system being put on it is that it was a good thing. Mm. And it's not criticized. They have statues to foreigners in Japan. And they talk about extraterritorialism as a stage of development, which you don't get in China at all. It, it was oppression. And so Fessenden was clearly part of that system and was fundamental um, in, in keeping Shanghai uh, foreign. And that's probably the largest part of his legacy in the way the Chinese see the world. Um, and obviously, I showed you the picture of the city itself. It's an amazing city, and that's also a legacy in itself. But um, uh, he didn't create that system, but he kept it running. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we need to stop here. Thank you for a great talk and a wonderful discussion. Many thanks to everybody for joining today. Uh, it remains for me to announce the upcoming seminars. Uh, the next Greater China Legal History Seminar will take place in about two weeks' time on the 4th of November 2022, same time, 12.30 to 2 p.m. Professor Zhang Zhaoyang will talk about civil disputes in the Han Dynasty. Please join us. Then we have next week uh, Professor Xi Chao, who is going to talk as part of our Greater Bay Area Forum about cross-border enforcement of securities laws in the GBA. 
um, 20th of October, 1245 to 145. And the Center of Comparative and Transnational Law, uh, the Transnational Legal History Group is organizing a book talk, Imperial Incarceration, Detention Without Trial in the Making of British Colonial Africa by Professor <coughs> Michael Lobben, who is uh, at the All Souls College in Oxford. This will take place on the 24th of October, 2022, 5 p.m. That's it. That's the end of our uh, Greater China Legal uh, History Seminar for today. Thank you again, uh, Doug, for this wonderful talk and many thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, we hope to see you again soon. We are CHK Law. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.